use tonight. And uh, our text is found from verse number 10, and we'll be going down to verse uh, 14. Hebrews chapter, uh, did I say chapter 10? No, 13. 13, 13. Yeah, verse 10, yeah. That's what I meant, yeah. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 10. And uh, verse 14. So what we're looking at tonight is uh, the, our text speaks about an altar and uh, we're going to be looking at the fact that we have an altar and uh, what we're looking at tonight really it, it, it ties in I, I was nearly going to be doing some of what we're doing next week uh, with, it, with our study tonight but what we're looking at tonight is closely associated because it has to do with our relationship and our communion and it has to do with our service and service and communion go hand in hand. Uh, but we'll spend our time looking at these uh, four or so verses as we consider uh, the fact that we have an altar. So let's read from verse number 10 and down to verse 14. We have an altar whereof they have no right to each eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts which, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him, without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. So we want to look at this subject tonight of the altar, and we want to stress the fact that we have an altar now, the Bible speaks about an altar a great deal of times. In the Old Testament, you have the word altar been found some 400 times. And in the New Testament, it's actually not, it's not found that often at all. But every time the altar is mentioned in the New Testament, it really is referring back to the altar that we see back in, in the Old Testament. Now, the altar was quite a, an important part of the life of the people of God. And... We find that altars come in all different shapes and sizes. That could be something that was very elaborate, or it could be something that was very uh, basic and simple. And essentially, an altar would be a, a raised platform that could be made up of a whole bunch of uh, rocks, or even one rock, and have like a tabletop surface. And the, the purpose of that altar was so that a sacrifice could be made uh, unto God. So it could be elaborate or it could be uh, somewhat quite uh, basic. An altar could also be used of different types of materials as well. You can find altars being made up of, of earth and stones. And of course, you can see it also of uh, a, a series of stones tied together. Also, when you come to the more structured way that Israel was to worship, you come across the, in the tabernacle and again in the temple you see that there the altar would be uh, made out of wood and would be overlaid with brass. And so uh, it could be made of many different types of uh, materials. But in the temple sacrificial system, when the, the Jew would bring the, their particular sacrifice to the priest to sacrifice it, there were some of those sacrifices that could be taken by the Old Testament priest and used for food. So once it had served its purpose as being a sacrifice, there were, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, there were some uh, sacrifices that could be used so that the priest could use it for food uh, for he and the rest of the priests. The, the sacrifices basically uh, could be summed up in two different types. There was a, a, sin, a, a sin offering or a sin sacrifice, or there was a sweet savour sacrifice. Now, the sin sacrifice could not be taken and used for food. Once it was offered as a sacrifice, it was to be taken outside and it was to be burnt. But the sweet smelling savour offerings, they could, once it had been offered, then the, the, the law prescribed that they could then uh, eat of that particular sacrifice. Now, as Christians, we don't look to the Old Testament sacrificial system uh, and look at the sacrifices and think to ourselves, oh, we should be performing some other ritualistic sacrificial system. We, we realize and recognize it was for a different time and for a different uh, 
dispensation and and we understand that all of the and we've seen we've covered this to some degree uh, in the book of Hebrews so far but all of the sacrifices that we see in the Old Testament they were they were a picture or a type or a foreshadowing of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and so we have Christ who has already come into this world and he's died upon the cross he he is indeed our sacrifice and so there is no need for any sacrifice to be made so we can say tonight that we have we have an altar now it's surprising that sometimes Christians think of things like this they think yes we have an altar and if there was a place where Jesus was sacrificed you automatically think of the cross of Calvary but that the altar that the Bible is speaking of here isn't speaking about the cross because you don't have the cross anymore do you that cross that Jesus was nailed to would have been used multiple times and of course if you go to Rome or any Catholic type of institution you'll be able to buy a piece of the cross and that that cross has multiplied like the bread and the fishes throughout the whole world people have bought a little slither of that cross or so they think <laughs> So, so we, you, you couldn't say tonight that we have an altar, and that altar is, is the cross of Calvary. Uh, unless you were saying, when you mention the cross of Calvary, what it represents when it, when it speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when we say we have an altar, we are speaking specifically of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our altar, and he is our sacrifice. And... So we were able to feed and feast even uh, upon, upon him. So in the Old Testament, they had a, sacrifice, a sacrificial system and they had altars. In the New Testament, you don't find it so much other than where it's pointing back to the Old Testament altar. Now, in some churches you may go to, you might find uh, an altar of some sort. So in, in some uh, Church of England churches, they may have an altar of a sort. Uh, in, in fact, even in America... Uh, you, you'll have heard this, I'm sure, where they will have an altar call. And so they'll, you know, the preacher will preach his, his sermon, and then at the end of the sermon, he'll give a challenge to people who perhaps who, who don't know Christ the Savior and say, well, why don't you come to the altar and get right with God? And on an American ear, this sounds perfectly normal. On your ear and my ear, it sounds quite strange because we recognize that's not an altar at all. And so an altar call in America is is a regular part of every Sunday service whether it's a person coming to Christ for salvation or a believer coming to God to get right with a certain thing they'll use this terminology come to the altar but but scripturally speaking that's not, that's not quite correct because our altar isn't an altar made of wood and it's certainly not a place in the building that you can go to to get right with God. Because the fact of the matter is, you can get right with God anywhere and everywhere. But our altar is, of course, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and it's because He is our altar that we're able to bring spiritual sacrifices. Not earthly, uh, temporal uh, sacrifices, but we're able to bring heavenly sacrifices because we have a heavenly altar. Even... Our Lord Jesus Christ so to the believing Jews who were receiving this letter and again it's almost as if you know the author is, is getting to the place where he's calling upon these people to make a, a once and for all decision not to go back to the old sacrificial system to the the Jew that was a Christian now and was being persecuted for their faith and thinking to themselves that there's this big draw to go back to Jerusalem because we always think it's better in the past if we could just go back to Jerusalem and go back to the temple and then you go back to the temple and there you have the priests in their priestly robes and there you have them uh, performing the sacrifices and everything's done in in a way that is going to appeal to the senses and the person looking at it can say well look at this they are performing these sacrifices and eating these sacrifices and this is how it's been for hundreds of years 
This is, this is how, how it was prescribed from, from Moses' day to when the people had the tabernacle. And then later on in Solomon and day, at Solomon's day where they had the, the temple. And this is how we've always done things. And there's something reassuring about doing things that you've always done. And so there was this huge temptation to go back to the law. Go back to the temple sacrifices and to get involved with all that was happening there. But the writer to the Hebrews, he's urging these believers not to go back, but to go on. And he's urging them to be looking at things that aren't seen instead of looking at the temporal sacrifices that are being made in Jerusalem. From a practical point of view, and this isn't the reason, this certainly isn't the reason why they were told not to go back to the ceremonial aspects of the law, but we could say on a practical level, these people hadn't taken to heart the, um, the warning that our Saviour had given concerning Jerusalem and concerning the temple. Remember in the book of Mark as to how the disciples, you know, they almost wanted to impress the Lord with the, the grandeur of the temple. Have you seen all these wonderful buildings, Lord? How, how great it is. And Jesus would have to say that there's going to come a time where not one stone is going to be left upon another. He foretold about the destruction of Jerusalem. So they hadn't taken it to heart that, that, you know, this sacrificial system was literally on borrowed time. It was going to come to an end. And God was going to see to it that it would come to an end. Now, now, of course, it had all been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they should have, the Jews should have recognized it and, and it should have naturally come to an end. But they would not. They hold on to their old sacrificial system. Well, around about AD 68, there became a there was a, a huge Jewish revolt and they tried to get under, out from under the control of the Roman government. And uh, um, Nero was at the forefront of the, um, the, the uh, a fiery persecution against believers and against Jews. And he, he sent, and I can't remember his name offhand now, I want to say Pistachian, uh, or something like that, uh, but I, the name escapes me. But but he was sent to go and uh, and control um, Jerusalem in AD 68. Well, Nero died, and there was a power vacuum in Rome, and and this this um, general was called back to Rome to become the the emperor. And his son Titus, who also was a general, was then charged with the um, the. The, the, uh, the, the great charge of bringing Jerusalem uh, to heal and to bring the Jews to heal. Well, what happened is the Roman soldiers became so incensed uh, because of the, the Jewish people that they could hardly be controlled by the powers of Rome. And they sacked and they razed the temple to the ground. They utterly destroyed it. So, so these Jews, they, they should have took to heart the warning that Jesus had given concerning the destruction of the temple. And how foolish would it be for a Jewish believer? And of course, the, the Jewish historian uh, Josephus, Josephus, who was, he wasn't a believer, but he, he lived during this revolt and during the destruction of Jerusalem. And he, spoke, he speaks in great vivid language as to how uh, terrible the bloodshed was under the, um, the, the siege against Jerusalem. And thousands upon thousands of Jews were killed. Others were taken throughout the world as slaves. And Josephus, for some other reason, they looked upon him favorably. And he was taken uh, you know, into a safe place uh, by Rome. But from him, we have a lot of valuable information concerning the history of that time. But he speaks about the utter destruction and the terrible... Um, persecution of the Jews. Now can you imagine what it would have been like for a Jewish believer thinking to himself, I'm going to escape persecution and go back to Jerusalem and go back to the temple 
and there they'll have it worse than ever before. But, but this is not the reason why they are warned against it. The, the, of course, the greatest reason why they're warned against going back to the ceremonial law is because how great an insult it would be to our Lord and our Saviour. After all that is done at Calvary to shed his precious blood for our sins, <coughs> making the way possible that we could be reconciled to God, and then a believer takes a bull or a goat and sacrifices it upon an altar. Why, wow, that would be like trampling underfoot the blood of Christ. And so it was a terrible thing for any <coughs> believer to think, well, I'll go back to the old system and there seek to bring myself under that ceremonial law. But under the old dispensation, the priests had the, the privilege, and I wonder if people didn't look at the priests and think, oh, I wish I could do what they're doing, because they're taking the animal and they're sacrificing it, and then they have the privilege of eating the flesh of the animal that was sacrificed. And I wonder if people looked on from afar, in the far and said, oh, I wish we could participate in the same way that the priests could. Well, they couldn't. Well, we read in our text in verse 10, We have an altar, whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. You see, under this new dispensation, because of our Lord Jesus Christ going to Calvary, the New Testament believer, he is able to feed and is able to drink spiritually upon our Lord Jesus Christ. We could say, He is our peace offering. <coughs> he is our sweet-smelling, savouring offering to God. And those priests who are performing these ceremonial sacrifices and eating those sacrifices, they have no right to eat at this altar from which you and I eat. Now Jesus expounded this in the in the time when he uh, he, uh, he spoke to the to, to the to the uh, to, to the crowd in John chapter six, and he spoke of himself as being as one of those I am statements, where he speaks of himself as being the bread of life, and he said, "Whoso eateth um, my flesh, drinketh my blood, hath eternal life. Uh, my flesh is meat indeed; my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him." And then in verse 58, he said, This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread, speaking about himself, shall live forever. And then remember when Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, and he told her, give me to drink. And then uh, he said to her, if you'd asked me to give you something to drink, um, I'll give you something that will satisfy you for all eternity. This is what he said. Whosoever drink of this, of this water, talking about the water of the well, he said, they would thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never foot thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So we find that as believers tonight, that we can say we have an altar. It's not a place that we go to, it's a person that we go to. We have an altar whereof we're able to feast upon. We, we feed upon him spiritually. And they have no right to come to this altar who do not know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in the same way that in the Old Testament the sin sacrifice was to be taken and after the blood had been applied... It was to be taken outside of the camp and it was there to be burnt. So we read that our Saviour was taken outside of the camp. In verse 12 it says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. And then he goes on to say, Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. So for the Jewish believer, the place, or the Jewish Christian more specifically, the place was to, to be, was to be outside of the camp. 
they weren't to be thinking, I'll go back to Jerusalem, I'll go back to Judaism, and there I'll be able to worship. No, no, they had to be like the Savior, go outside of the camp. And, and that's where they, they should have wanted to be. That's where we belong, and that's where we should want to be. This is essentially what you're saying. And, and these believers needed to understand that there's no way that they could have true communion with Christ and still be in the camp of Judaism. They needed to totally be separate from it. Now tonight, you know, we, we think about this, and that this has been a, a difficult passage, I must say. I'm just kind to, I'm trying to just shed a bit of light, and I hope you can understand what he's talking about in these verses. But in these verses, we can say to ourselves, well, I don't have the same kind of temptation that the Jews had, because we aren't tempted to go back to Judaism, we were never in it. We can't be tempted to go back into, you know, a ceremonial system of sacrifices because we never experienced that. So that doesn't really apply to us at all. But there is a temptation that each and every one of us have, and that temptation is to go back into the world. Every believer has this temptation before them. And we, we ever need to be mindful of the fact that um, that worldliness is sinfulness. And worldliness is going to be a, an ongoing temptation for the believer. And the difficulty that we have is that we're in the world. So, so we're always there. We always have around about us. And the temptation is ever before us. But while we're in it, we must not be of the world. And we kind of need to be like the boat that is floating on the water. You know, there isn't a problem when a boat's on the water and it's sailing through the seas. You think to yourself, well, this is fine. There's no problem here. But once you get water into the boat, well, then things become very dangerous. And so it is with you and I. We can be in the world and we can be serving the Lord and kind of just being aloof from all that's going on. But if we get the world into us, well, that, that makes for some very dangerous times. So for you and I, we could say, well, the, the danger is of going back to, to worldliness. For them, their danger was going back to the Judaic system and ceremonies of sacrifices. And so the, the call from the Word of God is that we would come out from the world and that we would be separate. I'd like you to turn with me, if you would, to 2 Corinthians in chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6. And this is a call for a believer to be separate from the world and to come out from being, a, being worldly. So Second Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. So Paul writes here, he says, Be not be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So the call for the believer is that we would come out from the world, that we would leave this world side, go out to the gate, if you like, outside of the camp, and go to our Saviour. And they willingly bear his reproach. Now sometimes believers kind of shrink back at this. They don't like to think of themselves as bearing the reproach of Christ. But we should ever be mindful of the fact that Jesus Christ willingly bore our reproach. And so the one that bore our reproach is now outside of the camp. And so because of the fact that he's our saviour and he's our Lord, the believer should say, well, where he is, I want to be. That's where I belong. And if I must go outside of the camp, outside of the world system and outside of worldliness, and if I must bear his reproach, then I'll do it and do it joyfully. This is what Peter wrote concerning it. 
and he he spoke of the trial that the believers would have in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verses 12 to 14. He said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, insomuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached, for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. So whether it be for the believer to come out of the camp of organized religion, or for the believer to come out of the camp of worldliness, and so bear the reproach of Christ, we should willingly and gladly bear his reproach so that he might indeed be glorified, even if they speak evil of us, just as long as the Lord Jesus Christ can be glorified. So this is the encouragement that these believers are having. Come out from the, the system and, and, and the, the rituals of the law. Go outside of the camp. Go, go to the Savior where, where he was taken, where he was crucified, where he bore your reproach. Even if you become a reproach, while, while you do that. And then he goes on and he encourages these believers in verse 14. He says, For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. So what he's saying is, yeah, is that all of our prospects are heavenward and not earthly bound. We, to these believers who grew up as Jews and now were, were, were Christians, He's saying, you're not looking for an earthly Jerusalem. You need to be looking for a heavenly Jerusalem. He's saying, you're not looking for a Jewish temple, but you're looking for Christ. In fact, in the book of Revelation, in, in chapter 21, where it des describes the new Jerusalem, this is what John says. He says, I saw no temple therein. So he, he goes to great pains to describe uh, the, the heavenly Jerusalem. And or New Jerusalem, and he says, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. He's saying, don't go back. You need to be going forward. You need to recognize that, you know, we have here uh, something, a system that is, has already been done away with. But we're looking for something that is going to continue forever. And so the encouragement is to go on looking uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can see how foolish it would be for somebody who was a Jew and now saved and then thinking, I'd like to go back to the old Jewish way of serving God, the old ceremonial worship, taking animals and sacrificing it and seeing the priest eat of that, at that altar. He's saying that's foolish. We, we have an altar that nobody can eat of. They have no right to eat of it unless they have been born again by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying you need to look beyond these earthly scenes and you need to look up to the glorious heavenly scenes that await you. So he's encouraging them to look forward to um, the Lord Jesus Christ and to look forward to being able to have the sweet communion with him in the future. But of course, it's not just a matter of in the future, it's what we're able to have right now. And next week, we'll look at the fact of how we're able to serve. Service is a very important part of our Christian life. But our service has to come from our worship. If we've gone outside of the camp and we're spending time with our Savior, we're feeding upon him and uh, we, we're drinking upon him, and then we find that we're, when we're having sweet communion with him, we're able to be uh, offering those spiritual sacrifices. And we'll see them next week, the, the spiritual sacrifices of praise and those sacrifices of good works. But it's got to stem from our sweet communion that we have in Christ today. So we have an altar. And so I hope you get something from it. It's a, it's a bit of a complex uh, a piece of scripture. I trust has been... Uh, I shed some light as we see that we have uh, 
an altar, that only those that have been born again have a right to come and eat it. The old system would just be totally foolish to go back to a system that has been totally done away with in our Lord and our Saviour. So we'll stop there. Let's uh, have a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for your word and we're thankful, Lord, for the, the, the promises that we have. We thank you, Lord, that we have a, a full and free salvation in our Saviour. We're thankful, Father, that uh, all of the types and all of the figures uh, are, uh, find their completion and fulfillment even in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that we're not tempted to go back to a Jewish way of worship, uh, but we, we do recognise, Father, that there's a temptation to go back into the world. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to recognise that we need to uh, remain uh, free from the, the snares of this life, that we would go outside of the camp of this world, bearing the reproach of our Saviour, and there uh, be able to have sweet communion uh, with Him. So, Father, do you bless us, we pray, encourage us as we consider these things, for we ask it in Jesus' name.